obviously in these uh, different times, uh, this is a, 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 not a new way of to, to be able to speak uh, and have conferences like this without all the travel. But um, uh, I was asked to talk today about um, uh, posterior spinal osteotomies for uh, treating spinal deformity. That will be my uh, lecture for today. Uh, here are my disclosures that I'm required to acknowledge. Most importantly, I do receive uh, substantial royalties from Medtronic for much of the equipment that I have some intellectual property in that you'll see. So basically for the last 20 years, I've treated uh, every pediatric and adult deformity from a posterior only approach. And the reason that we could do this uh, uh, includes obviously the use of pedicle screws throughout the spine as the main stabilizer uh, or grip of the spine, uh, the carpentry or what I call the loosening of the spine by the various posterior osteotomies that we're going to focus on today with the three main types. Uh, at the bottom of constructs, especially in adults, we often do T-lifts if we need to for both correction and for fusion. Obviously, we have a variety of bone graft options available. Uh, we use spinal cord monitoring on all of these surgeries to keep uh, neurologic safety. And again, uh, uh, because of these uh, uh, methods, we are able to treat really any deformity from a posture only approach. So the three main types of categories of osteotomies that, you, uh, that I'll reference today include the PCO, posterior column osteotomy, the PSO, the pedicle subtraction osteotomy, and the VCR, vertebral column resection. Now, Frank Schwab and I uh, came up with these uh, six grades of posterior destabilization that we can um, uh, provide from uh, posterior surgery. Uh, the grade one is a partial facet or inferior facet excision, which we really do on anyone that we're doing a posterior fusion. When we do a complete facet joint release, as well as the ligament of flavum, then we call that a grade one or, or grade, excuse me, grade two PCO, posterior column osteotomy. The PSOs are both grade three and grade four. Uh, the difference being in grade four that we include the cephalad disc along with the pedicle and body excision. And the grade five and six are the VCR when we do their single or more than one level complete vertebrectomies. Uh, and grade five are single level, grade six are more than one level VCRs. Now, how to decide the type of osteotomy perform is obviously uh, very um, uh, 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 controversial and also very a bit complicated, but the three main uh, um, uh, criteria that I want to discuss are the magnitude of deformity, the stiffness, and the angularity. The magnitude is pretty uh, obvious how large the cob measurement is. As far as the stiffness, uh, I tend to sort out uh, deformities into three types, uh, flexible, stiff, or those that are stuck or fused, as we published a, long, a while ago. And to determine the flexibility, to me, one of the best methods is just to use the uh, a supine x-ray, both AP and lateral x-rays, uh, as comparison to the upright x-ray to determine how much uh, flexibility is uh, provided by just taking gravity off the spine. So here's an example of a pretty straightforward degenerative deformity in a patient who's upright, you see has a 32 degree thoracic lumbar scoliosis. And when we go supine, uh, the scoliosis go to 22 degrees, so around 33% flexibility. And you see also uh, better uh, realignment of the coronal uh, plane as well from the um, uh, coronal plane perspective. In the sagittal plane, you see the same patient who has 35 degrees of lumbar lordosis from T12 to S1 increases to 48 degrees when we go supine. So just taking gravity off the spine increases lumbar lordosis, which is fairly common. And this is replicated also on the 2D sagittal CT scan. So that's another way of assessing uh, uh, inherent flexibility is just assessing the sagittal CT scan. Here showing again, 48 degrees of lordosis from T12 to sacrum. Now we can use this uh, uh, information to help plan our surgeries. Here's a patient on the far left that has lumbar kyphosis of three degrees 
But on the preoperative supine imaging, we see that lumbar kyphosis improves to 37 degrees of, of lordosis. Intraop, we replicate that. Uh, here's an intraop image showing 38 degrees lordosis. And again, with just um, facet releases and instrumented correction, we get, we get 51 degrees of lordosis and plenty of correction of the sagittal malalignment in this patient without any osteotomies being performed. And we studied this and we know that just by posterior positioning alone, we can add up to 18 degrees of lordosis uh, if we'd like in those areas that are not uh, already fused. So we can use this to our advantage in planning the, the amount of correction we need, knowing that we can often obtain 15 to 20 degrees of lordosis just by proper positioning alone on a, on a uh, OSI type um, uh, frame. So again, these are amounts of lordosis often achieved by several osteotomies. So if we can properly position our patients, we can get, uh, again, 15 to 20 degrees of lordosis just by positioning alone. Now, angularity, uh, I like to quantify by the deformity angular ratio, or DAR, a term that we uh, started using around 10 years ago, we published in 2016. The DAR is the Cobb measurement divided by the number of vertebra creating the Cobb measurement. So here in this very severe 159 degree adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, the DAR is 19.9. So it's 159 degrees divided by eight vertebra, creating a DAR of 19.9. Now the DAR can be somewhat innocuous. Here's a patient in the coronal plane, uh, uh, doesn't seem too severe, but when we get a, a axial uh, 3D CT imaging, you can see the DAR is 37.7 in this patient with neurofibromatosis and a severe dysplastic kyphoscoliosis. So again, as we have obviously a higher DAR, these are more angular deformities and they, these will need more advanced osteotomies to correct. In this patient, again, who had a myelopathy from the severe uh, angular uh, deformity uh, um, tethering the spinal cord. And we can go one step further and looking at not only angularity, but the spinal cord shape. Uh, which we did um, uh, in a recent study that has just been accepted to spine deformity, looking at the spinal cord shape classification system. What we did is we looked at uh, hundreds of our patients undergoing deformity surgery and looked at the preoperative axial MRI slice. And we sorted those into three uh, categories. Type one was where there is actual CSF uh, um, um, between the spinal cord and the body or pedicle here, showing obviously the spinal cord is free. A type two classification is when the spinal cord actually touches the uh, pedicle or lamina or vertebral body, uh, again, with no deformation of the spinal cord tissue, but again, uh, the, uh, the cord tissue touching the bony elements. And with a type three uh, classification, the spinal cord is actually misshapen and actually pushed into the pedicle or body or lamina by this uh, severe deformity. So it's uh, 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 being distorted uh, as it uh, uh, touches the apex of the deformity. So, and not surprising in our study that the odds ratio of having spinal cord monitoring changes during deformity correction of a type three spinal cord was 28 times that a type one or type two. So we really, look carefully at our spinal cord at the concavity apex. And if it's deformed, we really want to be very careful with that patient, often requiring concave pedicle excision or vertebrectomy for, uh, for safe correction of those type of deformities. And I'll highlight that in this, uh, in this lecture. Here is a severe angular deformity in a, what we call a type 3M. So not only is it a type 3 deformity, but this patient presented with gross myelopathy from the severe distortion of the spinal cord you see here on the actual MRI image of this severe kyphosis. So type 3M is a separate type of the classification, which includes a clinical diagnosis of myelopathy with the presentation of the patient. Now, another thing I wanna highlight is how we uh, selectively grade the alignment of the spine in the, in the various um, uh, time points during operative correction. So here, obviously, this is a patient who presented with uh, distal junctional kyphosis and uh, distal uh, mal lumbar malalignment from a previous surgery. You see the implants are pulling out here. So in the pre-op standing, there's minus one degrees of lordosis from T12 to sacrum. The pre-op supine 
increases of minus 14 degrees. So there's some flexibility, obviously, especially in the levels below. The intraop um, uh, X-ray before the rod is inserted shows 61 degrees lower doses. So with, so with implant removal, posterior column osteotomies, and you see two levels of T-lift, now we have plenty of lordosis, actually excessive lordosis in this patient that has a pelvic incidence of around 50 degrees. So during rod insertion, we actually take away a bit of lordosis. So we end up with 51 degrees of lordosis after the uh, rod insertion. That's obviously replicated in the post-op standing film for good all overall alignment. So these are the five time points that we need to look at when we do posterior surgery, going from pre-op standing to pre-op supine to interop pre-rod insertion, to interop post-rod insertion, which almost always correlates with post-op standing x-ray showing good sagittal alignment in this case. Now we'll take a look at the various three types of osteotomies that we perform uh, and, and as an indication of the criteria that we use for performing these osteotomies. So again, PS PCR grade two osteotomies, again, where we resect the facet joints and the ligaments. Um, uh, we can refer to these as SPOs or Smith-Peterson osteotomies if the joints are fused, or Ponte osteotomies if the joints are unfused. You know, these terms are often misused. That's why I, I just like to use the term PCO to refer to either an SPO or a Ponte osteotomy, uh, because really the, the um, bony and ligament resection are the same. The key with this osteotomy, obviously, is that we must have a mobile disc space. If the disc is fused, we're not going to get any correction with removal of the posterior facet and ligaments. So we have to uh, uh, confirm that preoperatively. Now here's a uh, great example of using uh, PCO osteotomies for correction of a adult thoracolumbar idiopathic scoliosis. Here you see a uh, 60 degree thoracic, 80 degree lumbar scoliosis. Here's a supine image showing correction of 57 degrees and 70 degrees respectively. And here's a push prone image showing correction to 60 degrees. So again, there is some correction here over time, but still a very stiff apex. You see the four levels PCO that we're gonna perform here. The DAR is 80 degrees over seven is 11.4, and there's a type one spinal cord shape. So PCO osteotomies are very appropriate for this lumbar curve. There's also a thoracal lumbar kyphosis that we can correct as well with the uh, uh, PCO osteotomies. Here's the coronal correction from a T4 to L4 uh, procedure with, again, PCOs uh, performed over four levels. We see very nice coronal correction stopping at L4. And in the sagittal plane, we see correction of the thoracal lumbar kyphosis as well with the PCO osteotomies, showing good correction of the uh, 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 thoracal lumbar hump as well during the, uh, during the correction. Here's another case where we use uh, PCOs, multi-level PCOs for correction of this deformity. Here's an older patient, a 64-year-old that presents with multi-level degenerative deformity and the uh, coronal as well as sagittal imbalanced posture. You see the marked uh, sagittal malalignment with a uh, lumbar kyphosis of 16 degrees from T12 to sacrum, a pelvic incidence of 53 degrees, so a PILL mismatch of 69 degrees and uh, overall marked sagittal malalignment of 20 centimeters of sagittal imbalance as well. So the key to understanding what to do in this osteotomy is the flexibility. So again, now we use our supine images. So here's a pre-op coronal supine image and a pre-op sagittal supine image. And you see, although there's not complete correction and there's some residual pelvic obliquity, there is correction of the, uh, 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 of the levels because again, this is a primary deformity there's no, been no prior surgery. So every level has a bit of, of uh, correction to it. It's seen in the sagittal plane as well. So with further correction with posterior column osteotomies, PCOs, we can see uh, the ability to correct this deformity. So this is what we did obviously with a long construct. We're able to get uh, a perfect correction in the coronal plane and well as the sagittal plane. We use what's called this kickstand rod to push the hem, uh, 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 spine over and push the hemipelvis down to get pelvic obliquity correction. And in the sagittal plane, again, we get nice instrumented correction as well, showing the overall good alignment. You see we get global film seal with, with the goal being obviously global correction in the coronal plane and global correction in the sagittal plane from the center of the skull all the way down to the femoral heads, knees, and ankles.
in this patient. So we published a few years ago our radiographic and clinical outcomes of using PCOs and deformity correction of 128 patients. What we found is that, not surprising, the amount of sagittal plane correction really varies by the level of the uh, spine you're doing the uh, PCO at. We averaged around 9 degrees of correction, 8.8 .8 degrees at every level. But as you see, we get around 3 to five, 4 degrees of correction in the proximal thoracic region, around 7 degrees of sagittal plane correction in the thoracic region, around 11 to 12 degrees in the thoracic lumbar, lumbar region, and around 9 degrees in the lumbar region. So we can kind of see, we can plan them, the extent of uh, correction we can get at each PCO level, varying on the uh, region of the spine that we're planning to do, to do the osteotomy. Now, again, the uh, uh, spinal cord shape also comes into this as well as the DAR. So here's an adult idiopathic scoliosis patient having a 92 degree thoracic and 88 degree lumbar scoliosis. The sagittal plane is fairly unremarkable. The thoracic DAR is 23, which is 92 degrees over four levels. The lumbar DAR is 17.6, which is 88 degrees over five levels. So anytime we start getting over 20 degrees of DAR, we start worrying about the spinal cord um, uh, uh, being uh, 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 having more tension and uh, less um, room at the apex. And we evaluate that on our spinal cord shape classification. So here's the apex of the deformity here. You see it's a type three spinal cord. The spinal cord is misshapen here because of the tension on the spinal cord along the uh, uh, concavity of the sharp angular curve. So this is a higher risk patient as far as losing spinal cord monitoring data. And sure enough, during after we performed the PCOs uh, and we started correcting the deformity, we lost our left-sided <laughs> concave spinal cord data. What I want to show you here is we have a provisional rod on the right side. We've done some convex shortening, and the spinal cord data is still absent in the left-sided concave area in the thoracic region. And I want to show you intraoperative views here now. We've done a part of a, a laminectomy, and I'm going to do a pedicle excision to free up the spinal cord. So here you can see I have a Penfield elevator here to get between the medial dura and the pedicle, you see how tight it is. It's very, very tight, the spinal cord. So we're gonna carefully expose it and hold it with a pen field. Now we come in with a high speed diamond burr to drill out this concave bone of the pedicle at the base of the pedicle to allow us to remove this bone and free up the spinal cord. So we carefully again uh, go deeper into the pedicle and the base of the pedicle body junction to release the uh, uh, very tight concave uh, spinal cord region. So now we have a Woodson elevator. You see that we've made the spinal cord very free here at the apex over three levels. And now the spinal cord data comes back and the spinal cord is free so we can continue with the surgery. So this is something again we have to pay attention to when we're doing uh, posterior osteotomy at the um, uh, apex of type three spinal cord shapes. So here's the final correction. You see, we uh, obviously don't have screws here. We removed several of the pedicles, but now we have very nice correction and obviously a neurologically intact patient, which is most important. Uh, so sometimes we have to consider that when we do PCO surgery in the context of a sharp angular curve with a type three spinal cord. Now the next type of osteotomy we do is, are called uh, PSOs. These are grade three or four osteotomies. Uh, obviously, the, the indication is for fixed sagittal imbalance or flat back syndrome or combined coronal and sagittal imbalance. Here, it doesn't matter whether you have an open or closed disc because it, we're, it's a three column osteotomy. Now, if you look at the number of PSO and B sharp cases that I've done the last uh, 20 years, starting in 2000 to 2019, with purple being PSOs and orange being BCRs, you see I've done. Um, um, overall less PSOs and more BCRs over time. The reason we're doing less PSOs is that we're doing more PCOs and in, uh, interbody fusions and uh, less uh, overall PSOs, although I did do 10 PSOs and 13 BCRs last year. But overall, 
you know, less than I used to do in the uh, mid 2000s, mainly because in, because we're doing just more PCOs to, uh, to correct deformity. So there's really three types of PSOs, a standard grade three PSO, what I call an extended PSO, grade four, where we remove the cephalad disc, or what I'm going to do is grade four, and we also do a T left below, do an example of that. Standard, huh? grade three, PSO, two year old patient that comes in with lumbar flat back, you see 16 degrees of lordosis, the pelvic instance of 85 degrees and uh, 18 degrees of sagittal imbalance. So it was a very high PILL mismatch and a very high pelvic tilt. So here I do a single level L4 PSO, an extension to the sacrum anilium. You see, I get around 30 degrees of uh, lordosis, which is pretty standard for a PSO. You see, we get uh, better uh, overall sagittal imbalance with a four rod technique here to secure the PSO. And the key here is to look at the uh, total body images. You see pre-op to post-op, you see the overall uh, global balance from the uh, 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 center of the skull, the cranial axis to the ankle is completely restored. Our goal is to get the cranial axis lining up vertically on the hip joint, especially and then on the ankle joint. So this cranial axis to the hip joint is perfectly restored. You see also the um, um, uh, compensation of the neck and the pelvis is restored and the knee, uh, absent knee flexion is restored following the osteotomy. So not only is the spine restored, but the rest of the global alignment of the skull all the way down to the ankle is restored when we look carefully at all these joints. Now a more um, um, severe deformity is highlighted here. This patient had a previous L3 to uh, L5 fusion with a severe kyphosis above. Now this patient has 27 degrees of lumbar kyphosis and a uh, pelvic instance of 47 degrees. So still a very marked 74 degree PILL mismatch. Here's the global x-rays, again, showing the severe malalignment from the cranial axis to the hip joint. Now here we have our five segment radiographic analysis. So here's pre-op standing showing 27 degrees of lumbar kyphosis. The pre-op supine image is on the CT scan showing Correction to only plus seven degrees of lordosis. The intra-op pre-rod insertion x-ray uh, after doing inner body fusion and PCO shows improvement to 15 degrees of lordosis. And then here after adding a PSO, grade four PSO and the rods, now we increase to 52 degrees of lordosis, which we match on our post-op standing film. So here's a sequence of images again, showing the correction from pre-op standing to pre-op supine imaging pre-rod insertion and pre-PSO. Now we have post-rod insertion after our PSO, again, with the inner inter body cage above the PSO. This is a uh, uh, L3 PSO. And you see the final upright images showing good correction of the deformity with the regional images here, again, showing re realignment and the global images showing perfect coronal uh, uh, and sagittal realignment on the global, global images as well. Uh, another patient with a more severe deformity that has both coronal and sagittal plane deformity. Uh, you see the marked retroverted pelvis, the very high pelvic uh, tilt of 58 degree, uh, 48 degrees, and the um, uh, uh, pelvic instance of 57 degrees. In this patient, she's had previous spine fusion with deep wound infection, so all the implants have been removed. And you see every level of the spine is fused except for L5-S1. So this is a severe deformity that's very fixed. So in this kind of patient, uh, we do what I call a sandwich L4, excuse me, sandwich L5 PSO. So here basically we do a PSO of L5, but before we do the PSO, we put a T lift cage L5 S1. And then during the PSO, we do an extended grade four PSO to put a T lift cage in the L4 L5 interval. So you see there's a sandwich of L5 bone left uh, between the 4-5 T-lift cage above and the 5-1 T-lift cage below, which gives marked correction of not only the regional spine, but also the sacral pelvic alignment here, showing normal restoration of a sacral pelvic realignment. We also use here a kickstand rod to push the trunk over, push the hemi pelvis down to get coronal realignment. And you see the multiple rods across the um, osteotomy side here with the uh, S2AI screws for sacral pelvic fixation. 
So here's a diagram of how we do this, the sandwich PSO technique. So here of L5, we first do an L5-S1 T lift. Then we drill out the pedicle and body, including the four or five disc above. We put the cage in the body, pedicle junction, and then we close it down again in the sandwich method, leaving some bone here of L5, but the resting against the four or five T lift above and the five one T lift below. Hopefully again, we do this for anterior fusion purposes as well. Here's the final x-ray showing uh, optimal coronal as well as sagittal alignment with excellent cranial axis realignment uh, with, uh, again, absent knee uh, uh, flexion postoperatively. And the uh, clinical photos as well of this patient. Now, obviously, these are extensive operations, and we need to confirm not only early but long-term results of these surgeries. So we've uh, looked at our three column osteotomies. Here's an, uh, a report of five-year minimum follow-up of 118 patients of mine, 96 having PSOs, 22 having VCR. So again, these are mainly PSO patients. What we found is that when we looked at the s West tree and the s rest scores from baseline all the way up to five years post-op, we see an improvement at one year post-op uh, as well as uh, an ODI s rest and these improvements were maintained up to five years post-op in both of these outcome scores. So we see the durability of the outcomes over time in these patients having these substantial surgeries. So the last type of osteotomy to uh, discuss obviously is the BCR, the vertebral column resection. Obviously we know this is removing, removing an apical vertebra or vertebrae separating the spine into two sections they can be shortened and then rejoined to correct even the most severe deformities. Um, uh, as you see here in this uh, brief schematic um, uh, example of how we perform the osteotomy. So I have uh, much experience doing the BCR for severe deformity over 20 years. And I wanna also highlight uh, that we've tried to really uh, uh, publish as much as possible to make uh, this surgery as safe as possible. So I published 27 peer review uh, manuscripts the last 20 years and highlighting not only the technique but how to make this as safe as possible. So really, I call this a spinal disarticulation. At the center of even this completely fused deformity, we separate the spine into two segments. Then we, again, we can shorten the spine and then correct the deformity by taking some of the tension off the spinal cord. So it is a high reward, but obviously a high risk surgery to, to, to do the BCR surgery. Now indications obviously are those with the most severe rigid deformities. Uh, we have four groups that we've uh, re reviewed, those with severe scoliosis, global kyphosis, angular kyphosis, and those with kyphoscoliosis. I've, do, I've done BCRs from C7 all the way down to S1 and every level in between. Obviously, those that have increased angularity or a DAR of greater than 15 to 20 in a spinal cord type 3 shape, especially a 3M myelopathy shape, are indications for a, a BCR. But it really should be the procedure of last resort when nothing else more simple, another more simple osteotomies will suffice. So here's an example of a, of a single level VCR done for a young adult idiopathic scoliosis patient with a 138 degree scoliosis and the spine is almost touching the chest wall. And this patient has very limited PFT. So doing a posterior only surgery is advantageous instead of doing circumferential anterior and posterior surgery. So here again is a patient that had a T10 single level VCR with a T2 to L4 posterior instrumentation. You see, this is probably from about 15 years ago. So I only used two rods, not three or four rods. Now I would use more rods across the apex. But you see the cage at the single level VCR site. Here's five-year post-op x-rays showing uh, excellent correction of the deformity radiographically. See the PFTs have improved to 67% of normal with increased uh, chest wall uh, space available for the lungs. And you see the corresponding improvement in the uh, chest wall uh, physiology and anatomy uh, with this, again, posterior only surgery without any thoracoplasty. So all the correction of the rib cage is through the spine in this uh, aggressive osteotomy. And here's a more complicated patient. This is a severe patient with neurofibromatosis. She's had several surgeries, uh, anterior and posterior surgeries times four. She has a 180 degree uh, uh, kyphosis with a sagittal DAR very high at 45. You see the uh, uh, 3D CT scan really highlights the severity of the deformity and the, also the type 3M 
spinal cord shape here with severe angulation and severe tenting of the spinal cord across the apex with the dural ectasia, obviously uh, evident by the uh, neurofibromatosis. So this is the kind of patient that uh, often will have myelopathy, as we see from the clinical um, uh, demonstration here, uh, the pre-op gape and the pre-op spontaneous clonus of the patient before surgery. Here's the uh, uh, spinal cord uh, prior to um, uh, taking off the posterior part of the vertebral body. So we've shelled out the vertebra. We have the posterior part of the body to, to remove. And the spinal cord, I call this a ribbon spinal cord. It's very, very thin here because of the severe um, uh, type three spinal cord shape at the apex of the uh, severe angulation of the deformity. After we remove the, the uh, posterior wall of the vertebra, the spinal cord gets its proper shape back. And now we see good dural pulsations following uh, the release of the spinal cord and then correction of the deformity. And in this kind of patient that lacks any spinal cord monitoring, often these patients with myelopathy, we are unable to monitor the spinal cord. So all we can go on is basically the um, uh, spinal cord uh, pulsations and the uh, shape and the palpation of it. Uh, so we have to pay attention to all those factors when we do this type, type of deformity uh, VCR. Here's the final uh, x-rays showing a uh, very nice correction of the kyphoscoliosis in this patient. And most importantly, the complete relief of the myelopathy in both ambulation and even dancing post-op. Now an even more severe case where a VCR is indicated is in this adult patient, again, with neurofibromatosis, very severe kyphoscoliosis with a very, what I call hairpin scoliosis, so 130 degree scoliosis, 180 degree kyphosis. It's really hard to distinguish, again, the type of deformity on the plain x-rays. The 3D, C, uh, excuse me, uh, 3D CT scan helps uh, um, uh, confirm, again, uh, the severe angular deformity and the even bayonetting of the spine. We make a 3D model of the spine to help plan the surgery. And you see the very severe truncal shortening. The T2 to L2 distance here is only 2.5 centimeters. And that's how compressed the cardiopulmonary system is by this severe deformity. Obviously, there's a type 3M spinal cord shape here. The patient's myelopathic with a very tight spinal cord at the apex. The pulmonary function tests before uh, halogravity traction, so FEV1 of only 26%. So before we do surgery on this patient, we put the patient in halogravity traction for approximately six weeks. We get up to 40 pounds of traction. And you see the slow correction of the deformity with improved chest wall alignment here. In the sagittal plane, you see the spine is actually heading downwards here. And after traction, it's heading up again. See also the distance from the skull to the spine is increased with the uh, traction. We also put the patient on nutritional improvement. And you see the weight gain here over time while the patient's in traction. And you can see that by just the uh, contour of the patient, how they look much healthier now before traction to after traction, and again, this is six weeks of traction. And we also see that the pulmonary function is markedly improved as well, both FEC and FEV1, now in a much more reasonable range of 54% and 42% uh, respect, or, uh, respectable. So this patient then undergoes a, a three-level VCR of the apex, here with the coronal and sagittal correction showing a great grade six uh, VCR, three levels. And here's the post-op imaging with complete correction of the deformity and of the myelopathy. Now you see the pre to post-op clinical uh, photos of the patient showing the marked correction of the chest wall deformity as well. So again, five-year follow-up of BCRs recently reported in JBGS, 55 patients, and highlighting the marked uh, improvement in the outcome scores, uh, especially self-image, uh, function, mental health, overall satisfaction, and subscores with this, uh, with this uh, set of patients. So in conclusion, I've gone through the uh, types of spinal osteotomies that we perform from a posterior approach, the posterior column osteotomy, PCO, the pedicles traction osteotomy, the PSO, and the vertebral column resection, the VCR. The indications are based on radiographic criteria, including flexibility, angularity, and the neurologic conditions. The posterior column or PCO osteotomy is the workhorse osteotomy that we 
use on the vast majority of our patients. We use the PSO for those major fixed imbalances and the VCR for those severe angular deformities, especially with myelopathy. I thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you, uh, you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lenke. This was impressive and outstanding as usual. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can very well. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we'll, we're waiting for the questions. I have, I have one question. If you, let's say, uh, facing a post-traumatic uh, post kyphosis and you need to do a, 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 a PSO at a level, uh, at high levels, like in the thoracic, would you go for just a, a routine PSO with a, with a hinge placed anteriorly, or would you go for uh, a kind of uh, minimal VCR in order to uh, not shrink the cord? Right. That's, a, that's a great question, especially in the high thoracic region. As, I, um, as you saw, you know, as we know, the, the discs are very small, and um, uh, you certainly can get away with a, a, a PSO type osteotomy. Although honestly, um, uh, especially um, uh, uh, in regards to fusion purposes, I find it better just to, to go ahead and do a, a mini VCR, a type five VCR, because um, the space um, uh, above the body is so small anyway, it's pretty simple and straightforward to remove the disc. Then you can put a cage in and get end plate to end plate contact with the cage and have a much better chance of getting a solid fusion. Because remember, we always have to have a, a pretty large laminectomy posterior in these cases. Whether you do a PSO or VCR, you can never bring the posterior elements back to, together uh, uh, to touch each other. You have to have a, an osteotomy gap, a laminectomy gap to allow the dura room to, uh, to egress into. So, um, so there is a risk of, uh, of not getting a solid posterior fusion, right? Now we cover that gap with either a rib or some other structural material but again, a lot of our fusions, I think, occur anteriorly. And so doing a VCR, I think, gives a, a better chance of getting an anterior fusion, removing the disc both above and below the uh, body, the post-traumatic you know, vertebral body that you're removing. So personally, uh, uh, in the thoracic or thoracic lumbar region, I usually do a, a VCR in those cases. Um, uh, sometimes, again, in the lower thoracic or upper lumbar region where you want to save the nerve roots, you cannot ligate the nerve roots, it's, it's easier to do a, a PSO, an extended PSO, because you can save the nerve roots, right? In the high thoracic region, I don't mind ligating one unilateral nerve root to make it easier to get access to the, uh, to the disc and uh, the, remove the body. So that's another consideration is whether you want to save the nerve root or not. Obviously, in the lumbar spine, we have to save the nerve roots. So we're doing, I'm doing more of an extended PSO in that kind of situation. High thoracic region, we can easily, you know, except for T1, T2 and below, we usually can uh, resect the nerve root without any sequelae. So I'll usually do a VCR. Excellent, thank you. So um, for all those participants, they are not all highly uh, competent deformity surgeon. What is your advice in terms of planning the surgery? Would, would they rely on softwares, applications? Uh, because uh, distinguishing a PSO from a PCO, from all, all this kind of osteotomy. So uh, we understand that uh, if, if it's a rigid uh, deformity, a substra substraction osteotomy is needed. And if, it's, uh, uh, if the disc is still mobile or, or uh, stiff, you can uh, get some uh, deformity correction by, by doing a Smith-Peterson. So what is your simulation advice for, for the participant? I think uh, one thing I wanted to highlight. Uh, Professor Link, can you stop sharing your screen? OK, sure. I'm sorry. Yep, I can stop. Uh, how about that? Is that better? OK. Yeah. Yes. OK, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I think that the key here, the point I want to make is that, and I showed a slide highlighting this, even though my practice has gotten more complicated over time, I'm doing less three-column osteotomy, yeah. less PSOs, less VCRs. Why is that? Because I'm doing more Smith-Peterson or PCO osteotomies. Um, I'm finding the utility of that much greater. Uh, you know, there's much less blood loss. And again, once you get used to doing these osteotomies, you get much quicker at them and you see they're very safe. So uh, that's one thing I want to highlight is that um, 
with good pedicle screw purchase. And again, you can place pedicle screws however you want. Obviously, a lot of our younger fellows now are very good at navigation and, and using software and image guidance, and that's fine. I do freehand techniques still. I'm old fashioned. But uh, the bottom line is however you want to safely put your pedicle screws in, because it's important to get very good pedicle screw purchase. Then once you do your posterior releases over multiple levels and you do slow, gradual correction, you can get tremendous amounts of correction with PCO osteotomies, as I highlighted in several of those cases. Now, again, the main risk, number one, you have to make sure that your disc is mobile, right? So be beforehand, you make sure your disc is mobile. But even if it's a little stiff, uh, as long as you, once you do your osteotomy, the, a little trick I've learned is take a laminar spreader between the lamina or pedicle posteriorly and slowly gradually open it up and you'll, you'll click, you'll actually crack any anterior osteophytes. So you can loosen up the spine from the back once you've done your osteotomy very carefully. So I often do that. I'll take a one or two um, 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 uh, a laminar spreaders and I'll slowly click, 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 and then everything breaks. It breaks it open anteriorly uh, uh, and, and loosens things up more gradually. So you end up getting better correction. So, uh, uh, so I, tell, I can tell, say that over time, I'm doing much less VCR, much less PSO, and much more multi-level PCO osteotomies for excellent deformity correction. And that, and that can be certainly used by any, any surgeon. Hopefully, you know, most surgeons, if you're fellowship trained, should know how to put screws in, obviously, and should know how to do poster osteotomies for set releases. So, uh, that's, so there's no reason why you can't do 90% of these deformities, honestly, through, uh, through uh, uh, type uh, two PCO osteotomies. Good. My last question before we get the questions of the participants. Uh, we, we know all your uh, teaching about uh, PILL mismatch. Um, so how important is, uh, uh, compared to global balance, how important is distribution of the lordosis in the lumbar area? How important for you in the pre-op planning? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's very important. Obviously, I didn't I didn't highlight the, the gap measurement, uh, but that is so, obviously the, to me the one of the most important uh, points of the gap measurement is the lordosis distribution, as you uh, as you've mentioned. So um, even more than PI level mismatch, uh, the distribution lordosis obviously greater distal from L4 to sacrum, less above, is is very important. So I and that's why I, I highlighted the uh, L5 sandwich PSO. That is a, really a very nice way of getting a lot of lordosis between L4 and the sacrum. Uh, you saw those, you know, uh, two cases I showed. I got a, especially the one case I got uh, 50 degrees lordosis from from an L5 PSO that was, uh, you know, created with a, a T lift above at 4.5 and below at 5.1. So, uh, and not only did it create um, a lot of distal lordosis, but also uh, when you do an L4, especially L5 PSO, uh, you really separate the spine from the sacrum, so you actually can. Push, put the sacrum back in better alignment as well. Because mm -hmm. you know, invariably the sacrum pelvic unit is retroverted. So when you do a low lumbar PSO, you can antivert the sacrum by pushing the sacrum forward, partly by positioning, by having the sacrum uh, pelvis free so it flexes uh, when you position the patient. And then also using cantilever of, of your rods to kind of to to flex the sacrum. So it's a wonderful uh, osteotomy to get more, more distal lordosis. Um, uh, with an L5 PSO, probably half my PSOs now are done at L5. Um, but, uh, in, in L5, the uh, sacroiliac fixation is mandatory and should be should be very uh, yeah, reliable. Excellent, excellent point. I like almost four points of uh, uh, sacropelvic fixation. So I often use either four S2AI screws or two S2AI, two iliac screws. Yeah, you want to make sure you get good fixation distally. Yeah. That's one drawback. You know, if I do an L4 PSO, then then you can only then you then two points fixation are okay in the sacral pelvis. But if I do an L5 PSO, I like four points. So, uh, and but usually, as I showed you, as long as you go distal, usually there's plenty of room for two either iliac or S2AI screws in the distal ilium, as long as you start very distal, right, right above the sciatic notch. There's plenty of room there. And if Excellent. you use navigation, that that's I think is a beautiful place for navigation. Yeah. Uh, a lot of my partners, I do these freehand, but a lot of my partners really like navigation for getting uh, uh, S2AI screws in. Uh, it's a very nice mm. way of, uh, of getting good purchase with those screws. I, I do it also. S2, yeah. S2 ilium is under navigation. I, uh, right. I understand it, that you can do it freehand. Yeah, it's, it's okay. difficult. Though. It's taken me many years to master that freehand, I can tell you. It's very not easy. Okay. Any questions from the participants? Uh, 
Yes, there is uh, Professor Gzez who wants to speak. Professor, please, Professor Gzez. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Linky. Thank you, Professor Asaka. And I have two questions. The first is, uh, do you uh, use the associated sublaminar band closure in case of PSO? I'm, I'm sorry, kind of, the, the question was sublaminar? Uh, sublaminar band assisted closure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the second question is, there is any method to uh, measure the angle of osteotomy intraoperatively? So the, the first question about sublaminar bands, I, I personally don't use them, but I, honestly, I've seen some very nice results with them. And I think if you are, um, if there is a challenge getting uh, uh, concave pedicle screws in, which is, you know, it can be very challenging and very risky, then I think that's a nice alternative, uh, honestly. Uh, I wouldn't hesitate to do that. Um, I, again, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable putting concave screws in. The way I do that is I do my osteotomy first, and I feel the medial pedicle wall, then I can put my screws in very safely, right, if you do your pe uh, osteotomy first. But, uh, but even then, it's kind of tricky because, you know, you know, the whole vertebra is swung, and you have to read it. You're almost putting a screw horizontal into the body. Um, so, uh, uh, and the reason I, I like screw purchase is that when, once I get screw purchase, I think I get better three-dimensional correction because I'm lifting the whole body as well as uh, uh, posture element versus the sublaminar band only works on the lamina. So I think it's, it's not optimal for three-dimensional correction, but certainly it's very good correction. And, uh, and I think it's a very nice alternative uh, to, um, to pedicle screws at the apex of, the, of a concave scoliosis. Um, uh, regarding uh, uh, your, your second question again was, um, how you measure, how you measure, measure the yeah. angle. Uh, honestly, um, so uh, I, I, I need to be honest. I don't measure my osteotomies uh, intra-op. Um, uh, I have a pretty good eye uh, just looking at the spine and looking at x-rays, how I'm correcting things. But I teach all my fellows that they must measure. Uh, you know, there's so many measurement tools available. But uh, honestly, I, I don't measure the osteotomy in the OR. One of the reasons being, especially for a PSO, uh, uh, for me, uh, uh, even now, like when I do an L5 PSO, technically, I do not remove the lateral wall. I do everything inside. I do like uh, eggshell osteotomy. So I don't, I don't expose lateral at all. I remove the pedicle. I decancellate the body from the inside. And I thin out the lateral wall from the inside. I don't want to go lateral and anterior and risk getting into the uh, uh, il iliac veins. So I don't, I don't go lateral at all. And I find I don't need to. As long as you loosen up the lateral wall from the inside of the body, you can get whatever correction you want, honestly. So I've never been one to kind of measure the wedge uh, because to me, it's the, the posterior element release and the, the, the anterior um, uh, removal of bone is the key. Um, uh, you know, if you try and close your osteotomy and it's not, and you, it doesn't close very easily, you need to remove more anterior bone, uh, uh, either curette or, bro, or burr, or whatever. Uh, once you, you know, have that long lever arm from the back of the spine all the way to the front, uh, it should close automatically. You know, you should release your fixation points and it should close automatically if you've done enough um, bone removal. If you haven't done enough bone removal, it won't, uh, it won't close. So to me, it, it, the wedge is not as important as, as much as how much bone you removed all the way to the anterior cortex. Again, leaving some anterior cortical bone for a hit as a hinge, obviously, and also for fusion. But, um, but honestly, that's one key for an L5 PSO. I don't go lateral at all. I don't put a spoon retractor in. I don't dissect it all lateral. Because also when you do that, you put tension on the exiting root, the L4 root especially. When you put a retractor in lateral on the body of five and you lever it, you're putting a lot of tension on the L4 root. I've seen neuropraxias from that. So that's why I don't do it. I just move, I work inside the body. It's safer. It's less dissection. It works just as well. Good. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. okay. Yes. Go ahead. Professor Thank you, Thank you. Thank you uh, Professor uh, Linky, for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation and uh, deductive lecture. But uh, uh, when we learn uh, in the literature, uh, are, there are uh, several uh, uh, osteotomy techniques and this leads itself to confusion and limitation in, uh, in indication and outcome. My question, how uh, your advice, what's your advice to, to uh, make 
easily and the safely technique to a young neurosurgeon or spine surgeon. So that's why I think um, there are a lot of different ways to, to, to classify osteotomies. And, and um, I think to me, that's why I, you know, Frank Schwab and I uh, uh, looked at the, the posterior kind of bone and tissue removal, right? And so that's what I referred to in that one slide. And that's why I really think of three major osteotomies. So if you're just taking the joints out and the ligament, flave them out and back, that's the posterior osteotomy. Whether the spine is fused, the joints are fused or not, that's basically only working on the posterior column. So I call it a PCO. Again, that to me is again the workhorse osteotomy. Uh, once you do that, you know you have about maybe a, uh, a centimeter gap or so uh, uh, of the dura. Uh, uh, as long as the disc is mobile, you can you can uh, create uh, you can take away scoliosis, you can take away kyphosis, lordosis. It doesn't matter once you have that posterior gap. Uh, right. Now the three column osteotomy. So I so that's the PCO. Then there's uh, the P three column osteotomies are when you start going down the pedicle body into the disc. So if you just go pedicle body, that's a PSO, right? Uh, so you remove the pedicle, uh, some of the body, and that's uh, and some of the lateral wall, and that's that's a PSO. That's a grade three osteotomy. That will give you more correction. It doesn't matter if the disc is fused; you can still get correction from that from the back. Now, if you take the disc above out, that's uh, an extended PSO or grade four osteotomy. And then if you take the rest of the body and disc below out, then that's your grade five BCR. So. And, and the key with the difference between PSO and BCR is whether you need to work below the nerve root. Remember, if you're doing a PSO, you're working above the nerve root. So it's very safe. As soon as you start working below the nerve root, then you're doing a BCR and you're putting more tension on the nerve root. And that's why in the lumbar spine, it gets more tricky because the disc is more, the, the nerve root is more at risk because you obviously cannot ligate the nerve root. You know, in a thoracic spine between T3 and T10, you know, we can ligate a nerve root without any problem. So that's why we, we, uh, we do frequently BCRs in the thoracic spine and PSOs or extended PSOs in the lumbar spine because we don't have to work around the nerve root uh, as much. So, you know, and I, so I think you have to look at the neuroanatomy. You have to look at what your goal is and how much bone you want to remove. And, um, uh, but the key is, as I've showed, I mean, with uh, pre-op planning um, uh, and uh, appropriate osteotomies and good screw fixation, you can do really whatever realignment you want to do from a, from a posture approach. Um, uh, but uh, obviously, you know, it just it takes some practice. And, and the key is you, uh, also that you don't burn any bridges. If you do, a, uh, a, let's say you have an L4 um, um, malalignment, an L4 uh, post-traumatic uh, uh, defect, kyphosis, and you do a L3, 4 PCO above, L4, 5 PCO below, and you start correcting, and, you, you can't, and, you, and it's still kyphotic, even after correction, well, then you turn that into a PSO because you haven't burned any bridges. Because the first thing you do for an L4 PSO is a PCO above L3-4, a PCO below at L4-5. So it's a sequential you know, bone and tissue removal. So you don't burn any bridges. You can try doing a P, you know, multiple PCOs initially. And then if you aren't getting the correction you want, then you turn the apical one into a three column osteotomy, either a PSO or BCR, right? You, so you don't, you don't really burn any bridges. So the, that's why I suggest that you start out at doing multi-level PCOs over a couple levels. And then and if you can't get the correction that you want, then turn the apical one into a three column osteotomy. Again, either a PSO or VCR. And that's really what I do. Sometimes I change my mind in surgery. I'm planning to do a VCR, but I start doing several PCOs and I'm realizing uh, that I can get good enough correction without doing a VCR, right? Or a PSO. So that's exactly what I do in, in surgery sometimes. So I, I end up downgrading my osteotomy because I, after my PCOs, I'm realizing that the spine is flexible enough that I can get enough correction. Good. Larry, we saw uh, your 3D printing model. Right. How, how is the value in, in your hands, uh, experienced surgeon? Would you do it routinely or for just for complex surgery? Well, maybe I can show my- Oh my, my God. <laughs> that's since I've been to New York, that's uh, 225 miles in the last five years. So does that answer your question? Yes, yes, I got it. <laughs> the bottom line is uh, uh, anytime there's a congenital deformity, uh, anytime there's been previous surgery where the anatomy is distorted, um, uh, 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 or anytime there's a severe deformity where I'm unclear where the, where, what the pedicle anatomy is, or I'm going maybe up in the cervical spine where I'm a little less comfortable. You know, I didn't really get a lot of training in cervical surgery as an orthopedic surgeon. So anytime I'm going into the cervical thoracic junction, I make a model and I study the model before surgery, 
and I take it in surgery in a clear plastic bag, and that's my navigation. I cheat. I have navigation in surgery. It's that's just not the fancy type. It's the old-fashioned type. It's the model. <laughs> That's, that's excellent. Okay, thank, uh, please, uh, among your uh, box, six types of uh, spinal osteotomy, what's the place of uh, partial uh, pedicular subtraction in this place? Yeah, so uh, uh, the pedicular subtraction, again, is a grade three or four osteotomy. And as I saw, the, you know, the main indication is kind of lumbar uh, 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 deformity with imbalance. So, you know, uh, flat back syndrome, previous surgery with uh, either fused anterior disc or very, very narrow disc where you're not going to get a lot of correction um, uh, uh, from the disc um, uh, in the older patient, especially uh, PSO is a very nice osteotomy for that. So that's, as you see, I, I rarely do PSOs in the thoracic spine. Almost all my PSOs are in the lumbar spine now, you know, very distal. And they're for patients who have major imbalance. If patients have only lumbar uh, uh, kyphosis without major imbalance, I usually just do several PCOs and T-lifts, or you can do A-lifts if you want, you know, people very commonly do A-lifts or O-lifts or whatever, you know, there's lots of options if they, they don't have posterior instrumentation in place. Um, so to me, the PSO is really reserved as I showed you for patients, not only with lumbar malalignment, PIL mismatch, but major imbalance to their spine, uh, sagittal and or coronal or combined. That's when I do uh, P PSOs mainly now. A symmetrical one. Uh, if I need to, sure. If it's an imbalance in the coronal plane, then we'll do asymmetric. That is correct, right? A little more, uh, uh, a little more remo removal on the on the convex side, the high side, and more compression on that side too. Correct. Any other question? Uh, I'm sorry for the last question, please, Professor Asaker. Uh, uh, in grade four, uh, five and six, which approach you you, you prefer, anteriorly or or, or combined approach? Uh, well, again, these are all done from the back. I've not done anterior surgery in 20 years. So I used to do for, for 10 years or eight years from 1992 to 2000, uh, half my surgeries were anterior surgeries. I did a lot of anterior surgery. I loved it. I mean, it's great anatomy. You know, I did my own approaches. So I was the general surgeon, the cardiothoracic surgeon. I did my own thoracotomies. I was trained that way. That's how I was trained. So it was great for the surgeon, but it was bad for the patient because a lot of morbidity from doing these big, you know, this is before MIS surgery, right? We did these big anterior approaches. You know, I did a T3 to sacrum anterior once, every level I took disc out. Uh, uh, for a patient with mild meningocele, they had no posterior bone. So I did every level T3 to sacrum anterior. You know, that, uh, it's doable surgery, but it's very hard recovery for the patient because we had to do posterior surgery too, right? Mm -hmm. So once I started doing posterior only surgery, again, with pedicle screws, osteotomies, T lifts, and then we obviously for adults we have BMP available, so we can get fusion from the back without multi-level anterior surgery. That's when it all came together that I could do everything from the back. And so since 2000, I've not done any anterior surgery. I do anterior surgery, but we do it from the back. I mean, obviously going to the front of the spine, we reach around, right? Uh, with BCR's surgery, we're re really reaching around the spinal cord to get to the front of the spine, and you can do that carefully as long as you have spinal stability by having temporary rods in place. And you do a very wide laminectomy, and then you obviously just your anatomy and go around the spinal cord. Um, uh, you know, I'm obviously I'm not a neurosurgeon, but I, I'm trained to do that, and I do lots of these. And uh, you know, as long as we're careful, most of the time it works out well. Obviously, you need to use monitoring. These are, you know, these are not risk-free surgeries, as you know. Probably 10, 20 percent of the time, we have monitoring changes. We have to um, uh, uh, pay attention to the monitoring. The nice thing about the BCR is that it's a, it's a spinal shortening surgery. So as soon as we complete the vertebral removal, the first thing we do is shorten the spine. And that takes you know, the tension off the spinal cord. Because again, in these severe deformities, as you know, the spinal cord is under a lot of tension, right? So that's why removing the apical pedicle, shortening the spine takes the spinal cord off tension. And often the data improves just by that alone. So uh, the spinal shortening is the, is the beautiful part of the, of the BCR even more so than the PSO, it's more of a hinge, but the uh, VCR is a true spinal shortening procedure. So we shorten the apex, then we can lengthen the rest of the spine. And that's how we can get such dramatic corrections without overstretching the spinal cord. If we just went in and tried to straighten, you know, sometimes as I showed in that one case, we get in trouble by having a tight spinal cord around the pedicle, right? So we can either remove the pedicle or remove the whole body and shorten the spine. Uh, you have to relieve the tension on the spinal cord, otherwise you can't correct the deformity especially in the type three spinal cord shape. So look carefully at the apex on your MRI. It'll give you a hint. If the spinal cord is already deformed against the pedicle or body, you have to be very careful doing lengthening deformity surgery because you're gonna put even more tension on the spinal cord and probably more tension on the blood supply, right? 
And that's what happens. That's why we lose data. So be very careful with that. Good. Okay, thank you. There is Professor Ait bin, Ait bin Ali. Who is speak? Professor Ait bin Ali. Uh, yes. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the organizer. Thank you, Professor Lanky, for this uh, very nice uh, lecture. I have two questions. The first is about uh, post-tuberculosis, kyphoscoliosis. Uh, is there any management particularities for these cases? And my, uh, my second question is about uh, 3D printing in neurosurgery. Uh, as uh, Professor uh, Asaker said, uh, can this technique uh, help those who are not very experienced to make uh, learning curve shorter? Thank you. Sure. So for the first question, if I heard you correctly, was around uh, tuberculosis, TB kyphosis, kyphoscoliosis. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. So thankfully, as you know, we don't see much of that in our country. Um, I, I've treated maybe 15, 20 patients in my career, mainly from international patients who have come over with TB kyphosis. Um, I, I, normally, that those patients have very angular deformities, often with myelopathy. So it, you know, uh, a, a type five or six BCR is a, is a very nice indication for that surgery, and I've had very good luck with that. Interestingly. I've not had as many um, spinal cord uh, monitoring problems or, or, or neurologic problems with those patients. It seems like I think the, the spinal cord gets kind of toughened by the infection. And so I found it, uh, I found those patients are, 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 are actually safer to do uh, than some other patients, like the NF patients, like I showed you. Their spinal cord is a little bit, um, I think, uh, more, uh, more tenuous. And I think my, my theory is that the long standing inflammation. Uh, of the vertebra and of the uh, spinal canal uh, uh, allows secondary uh, blood supply to the spinal cord to form. So the spinal cord gets better blood supply. So when you do the VCR, it's actually safer. Uh, again, that, I don't have a lot, I don't, I don't have a publication on that and I don't have data to support that, but that's my theory uh, because some of these patients, uh, you know, the blood supply is so tenuous. Uh, and uh, when you start doing the BCR, they start losing data right away, especially if they have very angular deformity with the type three cord. Uh, but the TB kyphosis patients seem to tolerate the VCR quite well, it seems like. Um, so I think that's a nice operation. As far as the 3D printing, you know, can you make this short, uh, surgery shorter? Uh, the answer is sometimes yes, it depends again on the pathology. Typically you need at least two or three levels above and below any major deformity if you're doing a three column osteotomy. It's hard to do, and sometimes even two levels is a little short. So uh, again, it depends on, you know, if you have a more uh, localized deformity, um, uh, 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 especially in the thoracolumbar junction, sometimes you can do two or three levels above and below, but you wanna make sure you have good purchase, obviously, and um, good control of the spine. But um, I wouldn't recommend just one level above or below, that's too short. You know, even two levels sometimes is, is too short as well, but um, usually three levels is, is safer, uh, depending again on the pathology. Uh, we have a question from uh, Dr. Wahid al Hassan from Syria. Dr. Wahid. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Professor Lenke. Uh, uh, Candy, I want to ask do you use intra op uh, halofemoral attraction in uh, uh, severe deformity cases? Uh, if yes, when the point that you start to release the attraction? So, um, uh, the only time that I use halofemoral traction is if there is a, um, a more of a neuromuscular uh, scoliosis with, with pelvic obliquity. Uh, I have had some adults uh, with pelvic obliquity that I'll, that I'll use it on, but um, uh, I've recently turned more to the kickstand technique. I don't know, you know I, I showed a couple of cases that had that additional iliac screw with a rod pushing over. Uh, I call it the kickstand technique that we published on. I don't know if you've seen that, but um, that's a beautiful way of taking a pelvis that's kind of oblique like this. You put another iliac screw in the high side and you distract and push the pelvis down. And that works even better than a than halofemoral traction. Uh, the thing that you have to be a little concerned about with halofemoral traction is that it does stretch the entire neural axis. So you have to be a little careful of, uh, of uh, spinal cord monitoring changes uh, uh, in those patients. So uh, I think it, you know, it is used widely by some surgeons. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of it. Although I do like um, intraop halo traction for patients, especially with kind of high kyphosis, where you can uh, have the um, uh, halo to position their head and neck better so they don't get extension uh, when they're uh, on the OR tables. You can flex them uh, with a posterior pull of the halo. But, uh, but uh, for most 
ambulatory patients, I don't use much halofemoral traction. More for the non-ambulatory neuromuscular patients, I think, is the main reason I use halofemoral traction. Yes, there is mm -hmm. Professor uh, Dr. Yusri Bushaib who ask for a question. Dr. Yusri. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Lenke, for your uh, great uh, conference. It's an honor for me to talk to you. Uh, first, I see that uh, in the surgery you make for this uh, spine deformity, first you put the screws, the pedicle screws, then you, you start to make osteotomy uh, depending on the convexed side or the uh, hyperextended side. So in our country, we have many, we had many, but for now, not too much. But uh, since time, we had many kyphosis, hyperkyphosis uh, with, with tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And we, you, we get used to make an anterior approach to release the spine anteriorly. Uh, and uh, maybe sometime in the same day or one week after, we can make the posterior approach to complete the, the, the correction and the, the, the fixation. So what do you think? Because you, you, you show us one or two cases that looks like, like uh, epikephosis with, with tuberculosis. When the, when the kyphosis is more than one, 140 uh, degree. And uh, what do you think about uh, when you make a huge uh, uh, bone osteotomy and the resection? Uh, it looks like the, 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 the spine is very unstable. Right. So, right. So, so do you think the, the, the fixation or the stabilization with the only posterior root is uh, enough? Thank that's you. A very, that's a very good point. So um, uh, what I can tell you is that in, in more of a smooth, non-angular deformity, um, I actually do the posterior osteotomies before I put my screws in, just because it's, it's faster and easier. But in a more angular deformity, that's why the, the deformity angular ratio and the spinal cord shape, that's exactly why I started investigating that, because what I was finding is that if I was doing the posterior osteotomies before putting my screws in, that when the patient had a more angular deformity, I was losing spinal cord data after doing the osteotomies. Because what happened was I'm, I'm making the posterior spine more, more um, unstable. And so the, the neural elements were pushing more into the bone or into the pedicle, right? So what I've learned over time is that if I have a more angular deformity, I put my screws in first and I put temporary rods in first, then I do my osteotomies. And that's exactly what I would do with a TB kyphosis. I would put pedicle screws in above the apex, below the apex, and actually have two rods in uh, because the spine is so unstable before I go doing laminectomy and then pedicle excision and body excision. Because it's very unstable, as you know. Uh, so that's what, that's what I do in, uh, now in three-column osteotomies that are very angular. I have two temporary rods in before I even start the laminectomy because without doing that, I've had spinal cord monitoring loss uh, even with one rod in. Uh, uh, I've had the spinal cord kind of drift more into the uh, concavity or drift more into the ventral uh, uh, angular deformity to cause um, spinal cord data loss. So I'm, I'm very, very um, uh, um, uh, uh, convinced that you have to do temporary rods first before you take apart the spine from the back in an angular deformity, especially with a type three spinal cord, which again, most TB kyphosis has, right? If you look at the apex, uh, the spinal cord is very tented over the apex. So that's a very clear and um, important distinction. Thank you very much. Uh, there is some question uh, from the chat. Uh, three question from uh, Dr. Nasiru Ismail from Nigeria. He, he asked, uh, how do you correct the deformity using change of operating table or uh, the scrolls and road manipulation? This is the first question. Right. Second which question, what form of retractors you use to protect the cord during this year? Okay. So third, for, uh, question, third question from uh, Dr. Nasero. Did you challenge with grit vessels in the cheese during this year? Okay, so how about the first question about... Um, um, how to, 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 
I know the, the second question was protecting the VCR or spinal cord during VCR surgery. Um, you know, I use standard Penfield elevators. Um, uh, I do have custom uh, 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 nerve uh, and spinal cord retractors that, uh, uh, that are part of our PSO VCR, what we call three column osteotomy set from Medtronic. So I, I have that are a little longer and provide uh, long, more coverage of the, of the dura. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, the, the key is to, to work slowly and carefully. And obviously you have to have the dura and protect it at all times. Um, uh, uh, so I think it, it really varies whatever, whatever um, type of dura protectants you have uh, to use. I think it really depends on what, what you're comfortable with. Um, as far as positioning the patient, um, again, I, I obviously position everyone. I use the Jackson or OSI frame. And uh, to me, the key is where I put the pads. And um, as I said, if I want the, um, the pelvis to flex and I want to get more distal lumbar lordosis, then I put the distal pads more distal uh, on, the th on the thighs and less on the pelvis. And that allows the anterior superior iliac spine to kind of fall forward. And that will flex the pelvis as you're doing your osteotomies and doing your correction. Um, if I want to prevent the spine from getting too much distal lordosis, then I move the pads up a bit to, to to, to cover the uh, anterior superior iliac spine and prevent the pelvis from flexing forward. So it just depends on what I want to do as far as um, my, my pelvic position, uh, how I put my pads. Um, uh, again, most of the correction is done with the uh, osteotomies and with the instrumentation, not, not so with the positioning, but the positioning can help you. So you have to pay attention to positioning as well. I see that uh, Dr. Nasero want to, to ask directly, Dr. Nasero. Yes, uh, it is about the great vessels, you know, the iota and the inferior vena cava, sometimes congenital carpal scoliosis. You may see as if they are tensing the spine. Uh, what is your experience with this kind of uh, patient? Because in trying to straighten the spine, have you encountered a problem uh, of this tented iota that has not uh, grown to the full length of the spine? Thank you. That, that's, a, that's a great question. First of all, I think you need to study on your pre-op MRI exactly where the great vessels are, you know, before you do a uh, three-column osteotomy in the thoracic or lumbar spine. Um, uh, it, full disclosure, I've never gotten into a, a large vein, either from a PSO or VCR, the iliac or vena cava, but I did have a one circumstance around uh, 12 years ago that I uh, uh, inadvertently got into the aorta doing a thoracic VCR. Uh, it's actually published as a case report in the literature. Um, it was not, obviously it was a very, very um, scary situation. <laughs> and uh, the, way, the way we salvaged and saved the patient's life was that I kept pressure on the aorta with my hand and we turned the patient into a lateral decubitus position. And my vascular surgeon came and made an incision in the groin and put a endovascular stent up the aorta and uh, extended, expanded the stent in the area where the aorta was torn and shut off the bleeding and to save the patient's life. Um, but I, I can tell you that um, that made me very nervous because that was not, not a very pleasant experience um, uh, uh, when the blood hit the ceiling in the OR. Uh, when we, so you don't want that to happen. So you have to be very careful. The reason that happened <laughs> is the patient had previous thoracic surgery and had osteophytes uh, formed against the aorta. And so when I was dissecting lateral against the vertebra, I uh, dissected into the aorta. The aorta was actually attached to the spine and I didn't recognize that preoperatively and I should have. So the point is you have to look carefully at the anatomy. And if the aorta is definitely against the vertebra, you have to be very careful doing that uh, an osteotomy there because um, it's, it's almost impossible to avoid tearing the, uh, the vessel, whether it's an artery or a vein. So be very, very careful. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a big pleasure to be with you, sir. Okay. Yes. So uh, I think uh, we have to, to close the session. Thank you, Larry. It was uh, wonderful. And thank you for giving us time and, and giving, uh, sharing your experience with us. Thank you very much, and uh, My pleasure. and see you soon. Good to see everyone. Thanks for everyone participating. I appreciate it. And, and be safe. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.
everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lenke, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you, uh, Professor Asakir, to uh, ac accept this uh, moderation and uh, uh, take care uh, of yourself. Uh, take care of yourself and uh, stay safe also. And see you uh, next webinar. Thank you to all, all participants. You're welcome. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Bye. Professor Hamani. Thank you, Mehdi. Oui. Merci, tout le monde. Désolé pour ce, ce problème technique qu'on va essayer de résoudre. Uh, why, why, je voulais juste uh, dire... Nice. Uh, I, I want to say hello yeah. to Wael. Well, I can't see him. So, Wael, well, it was uh, nice hearing you. Yeah. It was very nice. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Professor Asakir. <laughs> Be safe, and uh, uh, it was a very nice opportunity to uh, uh, see our colleagues from Morocco and see you, uh, Professor Asakir. Hope